Hello again, welcome, welcome back to our second of our two sessions focusing on the legal sector. Now, the first session, of course, explored the challenges faced by the legal sector, whilst this follow-up will look at business development. Our experts will share how they've shaped their practices to meet the needs of modern clients and the next generation, transforming their practices with technology, digital marketing, and more. So, without further ado, let's meet our first speaker. Our first speaker is Edward Friend, and he's a partner in Carrig Law, and he'll be addressing questions on business development, including succession, digitalization, cloud computing, cross-collaboration, and modernization. Edward currently operates a paperless law firm, and I'm sure his experience is talking about the challenges he has faced would benefit others. So, Edward Kreuzer, welcome, first of all. Let's get straight into it. How would you say digitalization has impacted your business? Luckily, we started the firm in 2014 uh, with digitization pretty much available across the board for the legal sector. Um, the only uh, software that we didn't have was the, the case manager system that was fully digitized or, in my view, cloud-based. Um, therefore, how has it impacted? It's been a positive impact and um, I wouldn't have been able to develop the business without uh, the products online uh, and cloud-based solutions in particular. So have you seen more growth and success in client retention, Edward? I've seen a lot more growth and uh, retention with both clients and fee owners because of the, the products that we use, both the software and the hardware. Um, clients very much enjoy the, the ease of use of communicating with us and their ease of access to file systems that uh, we have. Being cloud-based, they can, they can access some of their files and information. And fee owners in particular uh, have all been retained because they, they really enjoy the flexibility of cloud-based solutions and um, the hardware that we use, which is very much geared to being entirely paperless. And has this positivity impacted on your talent retention? Cloud-based solutions have positively impacted on our talent retention. In fact, all of the fee owners say they love the system that we have, both the hardware and the software, and they wouldn't go back to any form of hybrid or paper-based system. Um, we've been able to um, recruit quite a few um, younger solicitors simply based on our outlook and our, our, our solutions to providing legal services and the older generations who may not be um, IT native or, or have been used to paper systems actually prefer our paperless system and the ability to work anywhere in the world at any time um, seamlessly. Mm. Okay, what about modernization? Has modernization increased your business efficiency? Modernization has certainly increased the business, business efficiency. Uh, having experienced uh, hybrid or, or even the paper-based firms, they're very inefficient compared to what we operate. Um, <clears throat> I'm allowed to uh, focus more on the fee earning than on the business development because a lot of the processes under business development are, are now automated. Uh, and that means that um, we can make more money as fee earners, um, which means that you're more efficient. And does this put less pressure then on practitioners? I would say that practitioners uh, will fill up their time with more fee earning if um, their business is efficient from a, from a, from a development perspective. Um, so I think they're just equally as busy, but they're, they're, they're more busy with uh, making money than, than, than the actual running of a business itself. What are the benefits of a paperless firm? And does it allow you and your colleagues to access client information more easily? The benefits are numerous, as you can imagine. We have, um, I can think of several examples that are key. Number one is you've got all the information at your fingertips at any point in time, anywhere in the world. That allows um, fee owners to simply get the information when a client's on the phone, or if they're out and about with clients, they've got the full file with them. Uh, it also allows uh, colleagues to work collaboratively on files and on documents in particular, 
remotely or, or, or in a room together in a conference. You've, you've also got a single source of truth. So each document that somebody's working on uh, is the same document anywhere in, in, in the world and um, can be edited in real time. And everyone will see that information in real time. That's, that's very important for, for lawyers who are, who are drafting or who are working on a particular problem. Uh, the cloud-based solutions furthermore um, allow speed of access to, to information. You don't have to go and look for paper files. You don't have to look for an electronic element or a paper element. It's all there at your fingertips. You can also search very quickly and very, very powerful search um, within the matter of a few seconds. Uh, and that's something that you cannot do in, in a paper file. You've also got the security um, of, of the, the data and the information. <coughs> so paper files, or looking back at uh, historical law firms, paper files can be lost, they can uh, be stored in, 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 in less practical places like basements or, or up in the attic. They can also be with secretarial staff or with the fee owner, when maybe the, the partner or, or, or the, or the <coughs> secretary may need the file for information. With, with a cloud-based solution, everyone has that information at all times um, at the same time. And, and that's uh, uh, truly helpful, particularly when you compare that to, to paper-based uh, systems or hybrid systems. Yeah, I guess this paperless approach supports green growth and so maybe has the potential of attracting new, maybe young talent. What are your thoughts on this? Being um, the person interviewing and, and recruiting for the firm, I've noticed that uh, younger candidates w will, will prefer to work paperlessly or electronically. That's how they, they think natively. And it's very important that uh, companies move with with that technology to ensure that they can rec recruit the younger talent. Um, we wouldn't be in the position we are now with the growth that we've had without uh, the cloud-based solutions that we have. They're, they're also scalable and cost-effective. So you, you pay a monthly fee um, for any additional user and, and that additional license is immediately available without having to have IT uh, structures and um, teams behind you supporting you. It can all be done very simply and very quickly. Edward, having worked with both solutions, what are your thoughts therefore on the safety of the cloud computing option as opposed maybe to the more traditional office-based way of doing things and of working? Cloud computing is definitely safer than, than paper or uh, hybrid systems. The the challenge in setting up uh, the law firm predominantly came from the regulation authority not understanding cloud-based solution, um, but with, with the help of um, Google, Microsoft, Dropbox, and the white papers they produce on paper-based paper -based systems, uh, you could um, easily put the, the regulator at ease there. They're, they're also, in my view, safer because the data spread over um, several devices and, um, and, and backed up securely in, in several locations. Whereas if you have a server or paper-based system, then fire or flood or, or theft can, can um, easily have that uh, data damaged or, or you lose that data, that information. So I think cloud-based on the whole is safer. They also offer two-factor authentication, which I'm sure most are familiar with and um, you, you can also back up the data to a physical hard drive that's either in the office or, or, or off-site, and that, that itself is an additional um, way of securing your data. And have you encountered any cyber security issues? We've uh, been very fortunate not to have any security issues. Uh, that's not to say we don't run through scenarios often uh, and look at the worst case. And in, in running those scenarios, we've come to the conclusion several times that the system we have is robust. Uh, and I've also run this past the regulation authority um, to ensure that um, it, it is as robust as it can be. So to wrap up then, Edward, uh, what challenges have you faced in setting up a business 
of this model and how would you advise others who may want to move in that direction to navigate through such challenges? The challenges have been interesting, not uh, challenges I'd anticipated. The, the first challenge was the regulation authority, but I suspect given that some time has now passed and the software is more ubiquitous, um, that, that, um, that that challenge has probably faded away in terms of obtaining approval to, to practice as a law firm in a paperless system. The other challenge has been trying to ensure that all the data that we have is our data and uh, trying to explain that to several case management providers. We don't want our data converted or, or files changed. We want to ensure the data is our data and can be removed by us to, to another provider at any time or, or, or used in any way we want. So trying to use agnostic software providers uh, has been more of a, a challenge than I'd anticipated and there are very few on the market. In terms of the, the, the solution that we came across that uh, met our needs for an agnostic cloud-based uh, legal software solution, we went with Clio. They're an American firm. Uh, so initially the, the language of the, the software was Americanized. Client accounts were trust accounts as an example. But they soon uh, hit the UK market hard and that's uh, all been rectified and they've got a great team behind them with both software uh, and coding. And what's brilliant about Clio is it, it integrates with all the major Silicon Valley software providers that um, Fianna's are used to using on their mobile phone or their iPads in everyday use. So it uh, syncs with Google, it syncs with Microsoft, it syncs with Dropbox, just to name three of the big ones. Um, the accounting side, it also has uh, real-time reconciliation with Xero or QuickBooks or Sage. So uh, that, that element has been crucial to ensuring the business uh, remains entirely cloud-based, entirely paperless, and one that we can work truly anywhere in the world with. On the, the legal software that we use, there, there may be other available options, and, and I suspect that um, you'd need to research that depending on the, the size of your firm. Diolch Edward, thank you so much. Plenty of interesting insights there into the, uh, well, the amazing world of cyber. Okay, well, next to the stage is Kevin Harrington. Kevin works for Antir Cymru and he's here to chat about cybersecurity, software and hardware solutions and very importantly, how to fund this. So Kevin, Croeso, first of all, let's start with the basics if we may. What exactly is cybersecurity? So cybersecurity is really a strategies that your organisation can take against cyber attack. So we're probably aware of some of the security threats that might affect us these days. Uh, things like hacking, where your computer systems are attacked from the outside. You also have ransomware as well. The, probably the most famous example of ransomware was the WannaCry uh, ransomware, which uh, circulated some years ago. And it affected its estimated 300,000 computers across the world in 150 countries. And the type of organisations that found themselves under attack from that ransomware were NHS Trust, local authorities, Renault, FedEx and Spanish telecoms companies. So cyber attack uh, is, is becoming part of the normal fabric of, of life today. Another form of cyber attack might be through phishing emails where um, a perceived uh, authentic email is received from a known contact um, and the, the people on the other end are trying to uh, get your password or your uh, bank account details or other important information. But when we think about cybersecurity, probably the question we need to, to ask ourselves is, well, why is it important today? Well, apparently in 2016, 49% of businesses in the UK reported that they'd been victims of some kind of cyber crime or attack. Uh, in 2019, the UK government reported that about a third of businesses 
uh, had reported that they'd been the victims of cybercrime. So unfortunately, cybercrime is here to stay. Um, and when we think about the current climate with uh, the conflict in Europe, it's very likely that cyber attacks will become more frequent and perhaps more insidious as time goes by. So when we think about cybersecurity, very often the most vulnerable part of the, the security chain are people who might be sent an email with an attachment which compromises your uh, systems or other kind of phishing uh, activity where people are posing as other known contacts. So people need to be aware of what cyber security is and how they can protect themselves. So knowing the threat is there, what cyber essentials are available to businesses to help combat this and how can they achieve them, Kevin? So the UK government has backed a scheme, a scheme called Cyber Essentials. So there are two levels to the cyber, cyber Essentials accreditation. There's the basic Cyber Essentials and there's also Cyber Essentials Plus. Now the Cyber Essential uh, uh, framework that you can assess yourself against as a business um, is featured on the National Cyber Security Center website. That is www.ncsc.org.uk. And that's a UK government back scheme. And on that website, there are toolkits to help you to understand where your vulnerabilities may lie. So it'll assess your physical buildings. It'll assess how often you update your operating software. It'll consider things like what antivirus and ransomware protection might you have in place. It'll also consider things like um, how, how do you deal with updating your passwords and keeping your data safe, um, as well as a host of other things. There are five key areas that the Cyber Essentials uh, accreditation covers. Um, and the only difference between Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus is that uh, with Cyber Essentials Plus, you'll be guided through the whole process by an IT professional. Now, there is a, a government-sponsored framework of providers. It's called the IASME framework, I-A-S-M-E. And those contractors are approved to take you through the Cyber Essentials Plus accreditation. So working with those professionals will help you to understand where you may have vulnerabilities. It'll help you to plug those gaps and it'll help you really to document uh, how you're uh, se securing yourself against cyber attack. So it's a very useful tool on the NCSC website. Um, it's a self-assessment tool which you can work through to help you understand the kind of areas that you would have to uh, think about when it, it, in, it comes to securing your business from a cyber security point of view. I assume that there is a cost for securing this uh certification. Is there funding available for legal businesses to put towards this? For example, is there law society funding maybe? So the short answer to that question is yes, there is funding in place. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But also in Wales, the law society has committed to make funding available to legal businesses to uh, look toward attaining the Cyber Essentials Plus accreditation. Yeah, it's always good to hear that the, there's funding available. So let's move on, if we may, to another technical question. Are there programmes that support existing client and account managing systems that, that legal businesses might already have in place? Would it be safe and easy to migrate, maybe move from one system to another? I think it depends upon your level of knowledge of IT systems. So whenever you consider migrating from one system to another, you need to understand and map the process you, you have either in a, a, sort of like a traditional uh, sense against what the, the software provides in terms of functionality. So I would always suggest that if you're adopting a new IT platform, talk to expert users maybe get impartial advice from IT consultancy companies because they can guide you through the implement implementation of new systems, but also um, rely heavily upon the vendors of the software because they will have support packages in place. They should have uh, training modules available. They should have manuals on how to set things up. 
Um, and make sure you utilize all of those resources because they'll be uh, vital when it comes to migrating to any new system. But the only other thing I would say about when you migrate is make sure you back up all of your previous data and also have a good regime of backups when you're implementing the system because any system failure which you encounter, you need to be able to recover from. Come back to the actual use of the systems, uh, Kevin. Is there support and training offered towards the use of them? So generally, in terms of support for new software uh, programs, it's the vendors of the software themselves that will provide the most support. So they should have a training program um, where you can undertake training for staff. I mentioned previously about having a super user in the organization. So there may be a, a enhanced levels of training for key individuals in the business, which would also be a good thing to do. Um, the other thing you can do as well in your own business, once you've got a super user in place, is that you can actually mentor um, your own staff with that super user. So that super user shares all of their knowledge about how the system operates with their colleagues uh, and uh, perhaps the man management team as well. But yeah, I think making sure that you take advantage of the knowledge of the vendors, but also of other users of the system would be very valuable in terms of migrating to any new platform. And, and do these packages come with post-implementation support? Generally they do, yes. Uh, well, we've, we've just migrated from one accounting software package to another one. Um, and we were actually provided support by um, our accountancy firm. Uh, they, they use the system and so we bought that support in. Um, you can also, as I mentioned previously, get support from the vend vendor of the software. They generally will have technical help. So if you hit any hitches or bumps along the way, they should be able to provide you with support. And the good thing about support these days is that very often um, the support organisation can remotely connect into your machine to either correct an error or update the system and help you navigate through the system. Uh, we, we do a similar thing for lots of businesses in West Wales. So we support businesses with their technical IT support. And again, local IT companies can offer you invaluable support when implementing new systems. Now, Kevin, we've talked a lot about the software side of things. What about hardware? What would you say is the, the safest way, if you like, for, for businesses to source the hardware and maybe bulk buying? Is it supported? So. When you're considering uh, a migration to a new system or buying hardware or software, you can access uh, specialist IT support through the Superfast Business Wales service. Now, the Superfast Business Wales service is impartial. It's meant to guide you in the implementation of new technology. So that's a very useful resource, but also you can engage the services of an IT consultant to help you to so like navigate through the maze. Uh, when buying hardware and software, it's very important that you buy what is appropriate for your needs. Very often, people buy products and services which has got too much functionality that they will never use. So making sure that what you buy is appropriate for your needs is also one of the considerations that you should think about before buying any new hardware or software. And also try to think about um, redundancy as well. So if you have, perhaps if you buy in um, a, a hardware uh, such as a server, then you need to think about how are you going to back up those devices? How regularly are you going to do that? Where are you going to store those backups? So there are lots of different considerations that an IT consultant uh, or Superfast Business Wales can help you to just guide you through the maze of adopting new technology. Yeah, and in addition, I suppose there may be opportunities for practices to combine together to group buy maybe hardware to achieve the best price. Anyway, let's get back to money again uh, and funding. Is there funding available for legal businesses to utilise for their CRM and account solutions? Currently, the UK government has the Help to Grow Digital Scheme. Now, the Help to Grow scheme, um, if you Google that, you will find uh, the UK government website which talks about that. And the funding available 
contributes up to £5,000 to the adoption of either CRM or accounting software. Um, now, that £5,000 represents a 50% contribution. So if your purchase is less than uh, £10,000, uh, then you will get 50% of the purchase cost of that software. But again, there are eligibility criteria for the Help to Grow digital scheme. If you go to the Help to Grow digital website, you'll see all of that criteria. And you'll also be guided through how to select the most appropriate software packages uh, for your particular business. And there's also a list of approved suppliers of that software on the same website as well. So if you're considering funding for either CRM or accounting software, you need to go to the uh, Help to Grow digital uh, funding website and all of your questions will be answered on that website. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. Next, our penultimate speaker, Mr. Paul Jones. And Paul is CPM21. He's going to talk through some of the business development challenges faced by firms. So again, thanks for joining us, Paul. Let's start, if we may, by looking at the monetary side of things. Are legal businesses managing their finances appropriately? And if not, why not? And where can they get support? Generally, law firms have to manage their finances in compliance with the Solicitor's Regulation Authority Accounts Rules. Um, generally, again, uh, lawyers aren't trained in finances, so they don't sometimes understand the difference between profit and cash, um, and uh, that can cause problems within a firm. So there is support available for them. Um, they can get advice from Business Wales, for example. Um, if they've got regulatory issues around their accounts and finances, they can talk to CPM21, my organisation. Um, and if it's very specific to what they do, they can also get help from the Law Society of Wales. There's a Cardiff office they can reach out to. So, Paul, through the course of the pandemic, of course, we've seen a rise in the use of mergers and acquisitions as a means of business development. Do you think this is a sustainable way forward? Probably not. The most uh, that legal firms can do to become sustainable is to actually be adaptive to change. Um, and a lot of them have been over the last uh, four or five years, but particularly during the pandemic, where legal transactions still went on despite the lockdowns. Um, there are more mergers and acquisitions than there have been, and there are less firms providing services than there were. For example, in 2018, there were 259 more conveyancing firms than there were in 2021. So a sustainable way forward, I don't think so. Adaptation is probably the best uh, survival tool that firms can learn. Yeah, OK, well, in that case, uh, Paul, if someone is still considering such an approach, what do you think are the benefits and the drawbacks, if you like, associated with it? The benefits and drawbacks of uh, any merger are to do with scale of economy, for firms that become larger through merger or acquisition, then they're able to uh, have better favourable terms in terms of supplies and other items. But the drawbacks are that there can be a clash of culture because legal firms tend to have people who've worked with them for a long time and it's quite unnerving for them to be suddenly exposed to a different way of doing business. Could such an approach be the answer maybe to survival? In extreme circumstances, yes, it will be the answer to survival because I do know firms that have merged specifically to keep afloat. There has been a lot of consolidation in the marketplace over the last four or five years. For example, there were 259 less conveyancing firms in 2021 than there were in 2018. So you can see that there is a, a, a constant downward pressure, if you like, on the growth uh, of some firms. So some of them think about merging and being acquired. Um, but that's not always the right answer. Is there enough knowledge, Paul, uh, enough support for, for legal businesses to remain compliant with regulations? In terms of knowledge and support for legal firms to remain uh, abreast of compliance and regulations, uh, the answer is no, generally. The sort of people that legal firms recruit to help them with compliance tend to be ex-accountants or practice managers, and they don't have a compliance background. They're very good with accounts and general things and HR issues, but not with actual compliance um, because they don't stay up to date. Uh, sometimes they recruit internally and they use someone who is uh, a solicitor 
and actually generates their own fees. And then there's always the conflict of earning their fees versus having to do compliance, which most solicitors feel is a necessary evil. So would you say there's a need for more quality control maybe in the industry? In terms of quality control, I, I can easily think of at least four or five different quality standards that exist in the legal profession. I don't think there's a need for more quality control. What there is, is a need for more consistency around things. The Solicitors Regulation Authority haven't really helped with that, unfortunately, because their latest regulations and standards suggest that uh, firms can decide how to do things within certain parameters rather than being prescriptive, which is how they used to work. Is the growth in consultancy roles within the legal profession a barrier to recruitment and retention? Well, it depends. Uh, there are really three types of consultants that you can have within a legal firm. The first is a freelance solicitor where the solicitor operates outside of the uh, normal regulated firm model, which is now allowed by the Solicitors Regulation Authority since 2019. These types of solicitors tend to be older and want more flexibility in work-life balance, but there's not a big take-up of them. In fact, there's about 413 uh, of those since the regulations changed. You've also got then locums, um, which are classed as consultants. These tend to be people who are brought in on short-term contracts to cover absence for other people. So that doesn't really make a difference to retention or recruitment. The, the final type of consultant is the in-house consultant where maybe a partner of a business has merged with another firm and they've decided that they'll be a consultant for a couple of years for the firm to slowly absorb their client base. Again, not really a problem with recruitment or retention. Um, in, in fact, it can be a benefit for retention because usually the firm has to allocate someone to shadow that person and get to know the client base that they've been working with before they leave. Right, well, Paul, let's finish off with a question, if we may, around practice MOTs. Do you think that legal businesses would benefit from carrying these out as a way of highlighting problems and creating solutions to ensure they don't become bigger issues. A practice MOT is a very useful uh, product or service, if you like, that can determine a multiple of sins within a legal firm in terms of compliance and regulatory issues. It can also highlight management issues and strategy issues. Um, CPM21, my organisation, has been carrying these out for at least 15 years. And in every case where we've done these, the firm has been able to adapt an action plan and improve their performance, whether it be regulatory or financial. So yes, it can help. Across the industry, um, there are some firms that are so big that they would probably think they wouldn't need a practice MOT. But for your standard high street firms, yes, it's a highly advantageous tool. Good. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. And thanks for your time today, of course. OK, finally, we welcome to the chair, Mr. Chris Sweetman. Chris is a director at Sweetman's and Partners. So again, welcome, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, for this session, I want to put myself in the shoes, if you like, of business owners who are looking to continue to develop their businesses. So let's start with, uh, well, what's been a bit of a recurring theme throughout today. As a business owner, how can I attract talent in an increasingly mobile employment market? So competition for talent has intensified over the last two years. So we carried out a survey in summer 2021 in partnership with Legal News Wales. And one in three firms identified recruiting and retaining talent as their main barrier to growth over the next one to three years. And I'm sure this is an experience that most of the firms who are watching this presentation can identify with. So how has this been borne out? Well, lots of the larger firms, so firms in London, but also other big centres, have been able to attract talent from smaller centres, so places like Cardiff, but also smaller towns and cities across Wales. And they've been able to do that by offering uh, salaries that those people would get if they were working in those firms and living in those, in those centres. Uh, but also giving them the opportunity to work from home for part of the week. So you get all of the financial benefits of working for a larger firm, but you don't have to commute and spend time in their offices. So how can smaller firms 
respond to this trend? How can they uh, make sure that they still attract the talent that they want? So there are some options at a macro level, so firms can work together and take a collective approach to trying to build a proposition for attracting talent into Wales. Uh, but in the short term, or for now, you know, I'm just going to focus on a few ideas that individual firms uh, can, can take themselves. So the first one is recognise and celebrate the work that you'll be able to offer those new recruits. So lawyers working in those larger firms might typically work on matters that are larger, that are higher profile, they've got more zeros in them if you like, but typically they're quite far removed from the client or they'll work on a discrete area of that matter. On the other hand, you know, lawyers working in those smaller firms will typically get more regular client contact. They'll also usually have more responsibility more autonomy, more authority over their matters as well. And that can be a real selling point, and some firms do use that as a selling point, but, but perhaps there's an opportunity to do a little bit more there. Um, so somebody, let's say, who's got three years experience, uh, PQE, they may be doing work uh, that is uh, similar to somebody who's got five years experience in a larger firm. And that opportunity for career development and that opportunity to do work at a higher level, if you like, can really appeal to some candidates who've got those strong career ambitions. Maybe they've got partner aspirations. So that's something that can really resonate with them. And of course, you know, those people may choose to leave later down the line. Um, so, you know, you may be kicking the can down the road a little bit. Uh, but there's always a chance that people are going to leave. So you can, you can only influence and control that to some extent. Um, and there's an opportunity to actually turn it into a bit of a success story. So, you know, if those people choose to leave because of the experience they've gained whilst working for your firm, you know, that could, although it's going to cause a bit of a headache in the short term, that could actually be turned into a success story and something that in itself can be used to, uh, to help attract New, new, new talent and new candidates to the firm. Okay, and the second thing I'd, I'd like to suggest as well is highlight uh, the benefits of being close to the office and working and living in the region that the firm operates in, whilst also having the opportunity to uh, work remotely. Okay, so the second suggestion I'd make is to highlight the benefits of being able to uh, work in the same region that your firm is based, but also have the opportunity to work from home where, where you want to. So, you know, not everyone, not all candidates are going to have those, those fast track ambitions. They're not going to have those career aspirations. And actually, you know, not all firms are going to want to recruit candidates who've got all of those aims, because that in itself could cause a bit of a challenge, maybe not in the short term, but a bit longer term. So this is where supervision, this is where training, and this is where support can kick in. And that survey that I mentioned earlier that we did with Legal News Wales, that revealed that effective supervision or ensuring effective supervision was one of the biggest challenges that fit firms have faced during the pandemic. And you know, as we continue to work, at least partly on a remote basis, that challenge is, is set to continue to, to some extent. So those firms who are saying to their candidates, to their new recruits, look, you don't need to be in the office, you know, they're gonna to continue to have that challenge with supervision. So those smaller firms, who are recruiting people who live in the local area, you know, they're able to say to them, look, you can come into the office when you want to, to get that support, to get that supervision, to get that training. We're, we're here if you need us, you know, and you don't need to travel far. Yes, you can still work from home when you want to, but you know, you can come in and get that support as well whenever you want to. And that's a message that will resonate with some people, maybe not everyone, but with some people. And you know, creating that kind of environment, that culture will also uh, you know, foster a sense of belonging, which again is going to be something that would be important for some people, okay, particularly those who maybe felt a little bit isolated over the last two years. You know, so that's a message that can be crafted to appeal to, uh, to certain people. And um, yeah, there are other advantages as well of obviously working and living in the local area, in the area, in the region the firm operates in, its, its geographical markets, if you like. So you know, there are opportunities to network, 
that, that they're, they're more readily available, opportunities to build profiles, develop relationships as well. You know, if you're based some distance away from the, from the firm's offices or its markets, you know, it's going to be harder to do those things. So, uh, yeah, those things are particularly important in some practice areas, so commercial, corporate areas of work, for example. So, yeah, if you're able to highlight the benefits uh, of living locally and, and, and working in that region to candidates in those areas, that might be something that's going to appeal to them, particularly if they've got those partnership uh, ambitions because, you know, they'll already identify how important that is. And, of course, you know, the more support as well that you can offer to those people to help them with, with, with networking, to help them build those relationships, and to help them raise profile, again, that might be something that will resonate with them and could be a differentiator uh, between your firm and a larger competitor. And yeah, my third, third suggestion, if you like, in terms of uh, recruiting talent is to build on the excellent work that you've been doing in, uh, in the area of well-being. So uh, yeah, lots of firms through our conversations have done some really, really good work in this, in this area and it's obviously been an important area for everyone over the last two years. And uh, yeah, it's, it's well-being is part of this kind of wider picture uh, that, uh, that especially the younger generation are interested in, in terms of their choices about work and employment. So there's an opportunity to build now on that excellent work, so build on those benefits that firms have been offering, build on the education they've been doing, uh, and build on the policies in, in, in these areas as well, and turn them into a more holistic, a more strategic approach, if you like, to well-being, to help demonstrate to candidates that the firm has got a long-term commitment to this area. It takes a proactive approach to well-being, as well as a reactive one. And you know, it's interested in making some, some systemic changes, really, which is going to support the well-being of all of its staff. Okay, well, that gives me a lot of food for thought, if you like. But having taken your advice, I've now recruited the people I need. So this leads on to the next question. How can we, as a business, identify and nurture the firm's future leaders? So the abolition of the SRA's management train has left a bit of a gap in this area. There's no longer a need to do a management course stage one uh, for not three-year lawyers, and there's no need to do management course stage two for those who are branch managers or office managers. So firms are now having to make more of a conscious choice about investing in, in this area and having to search out providers that they can trust to give people these skills and behaviours that are needed. And Law Care's uh, Life in Law uh, report that I mentioned a moment ago, you know, that revealed actually that nearly 50% of people who are working in leadership management or supervisory roles have not had training in this area. For those who have had it, 90% of them said that it was very, very effective for them. So there is, a, there is a demand for this, there is a need for this, and actually it is useful as well. People are finding it useful to support them uh, in, in, in those roles. And yeah, in terms of how we identify those, those future leaders, um, so you know, some of you may be thinking, you know, I'm, I'm approaching retirement, who's gonna take over from me? Or you might be thinking about you know, nurturing that, that, those rising stars in terms of retention you know, an engagement of your, of your colleagues. How do you go about doing that? Well, there's a range of measures, and you know, they depend on the size and, 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 and um, budget that you've got, size of the firm and the budget that you've got, really. So a simple step, maybe if you're a smaller firm that you can do is just document, really, w uh, you know, the, uh, the non-fearing non aspects of a particular leader's role. So what is it that they're doing day to day that isn't fearing and related that you would want the future leaders, the future managers to do, okay? So it's quite simple to document that. It's a form of job description, if you like. So that's a simple step that you can take. Other firms are, are, you know, are taking um, different, a different approach. Maybe they've got more resources. So they're developing uh, competences for leadership, for management, alongside legal competences. And in some cases as well, these firms are incorporating these into career pathways. And you know, career pathways are becoming uh, more, of more interest to, uh, to, to, to lawyers. They're starting to ask themselves, you know, where, are my, where are my opportunities in the future here? You know, what's my pathway if I want to stay with this firm? Um, so documenting those kind of things can help give clarity to them 
in terms of what their choices are in the future. And interestingly, you know, you'll no doubt know this, that you know, some firms have now provided alternative career pathways uh, you know, away from, from, from the traditional partnership role. So there are other pathways that people can, can follow if they don't want to take up that, that, that partnership role. So uh, you know, that might be something to consider as well to help retain people and to help you know, build that, that, that leadership pipeline for the future. Th through that job description exercise, if you want to call it that, through those competency frameworks, you, know, you, you, you can then carry out a, a gap analysis, if you like, to just measure uh, you know, how your aspiring leaders um, fare against, against you know, what you want from them, really. So uh, you know, you'll be measuring both their strengths, you know, what is it that they do really, really well, where are they excelling in these areas, if you like, where have they already got those skills and behaviors, but also then where are the development opportunities what are the things that you know they need to focus on and that you need to support them with? What are those skills? What are those behaviors? And then you know the, the combination of those two things can then inform a development plan. Okay, so how can we build on these strengths? How can we give people the opportunities to build on these strengths and use them more day to day? And how can we give them development opportunities as well so they get exposure uh, to different areas, so maybe finance, for example, or you know, how do they get the opportunity to, 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 to take on more management responsibilities as, as part of their role? And those individual development plans will, of course, be individual to each person and uh, yeah, you know, tailored, tailored to their needs. But you know, some examples in terms of what could be in there could be things like uh, going on to a, a board, so taking up a non-exec role on an organization, so that's something you know, that I was lucky enough to do, and you know, I was a relatively newly qualified lawyer, and that gave me, you know, a place uh, around a board table, okay, it was in a, in a, in a third sector organisation, so I was part of conversations about finance, part of conversations about strategy, okay, part of some operational conversations as well, but you know, all of that was really, really useful experience, uh, and has actually helped spark my interest in, in, this, in this area. Uh, but yeah, you know, can you can you find opportunities like that for your for your aspiring leaders? And you know, in some cases, there may be opportunities in organisations that you're actually targeting as a firm for client client work. So there could be some business development, there could be some marketing spin-offs, in addition to uh, to giving those people you know those experiences, which are going to support them with uh, with their leadership and management development. So that's one step that you could take. Another one is obviously to um, encourage them to attend management development programs. Okay, so those could be open courses or they could be in-house courses. So increasingly we're finding that firms want in-house courses tailored to the firm and to the needs of, uh, of, of their delegates. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's usually as well, uh, it usually makes a difference to the, to the audience if the person facilitating the session has a legal background you know, that helps build credibility with the audience, but it also enables that person to put some of the principles that they're going to be talking about into a context that's relevant to the day-to-day -day work of, uh, of, of, of these people. And yeah, increasingly as well, we're building in more non-directive forms of uh, learning and development into our programs, including coaching and things like action learning. And both of those uh, forms of learning and development are based on the belief that usually lots of the answers to challenges and opportunities that people face are actually known to them already or they're in a position to find a way forward if you like and what they actually need is just the time and the space to explore them in a safe environment okay free from judgment um, explore the relative pros and cons of their different choices in a particular situation and find a way forward that's going to work for them and coaching and action learning are great vehicles for, for doing that. And they can help accelerate uh, the development of a particular individual. So quickly build their capacity, quickly build their capability, and just as importantly, quickly build their confidence. So they're well equipped then to, to proceed and take that, take that matter forward. Yeah, something else as well that can, can, can help is just delegating on management matters as well as client matters. So, you know, these aspiring leaders will typically all, all have client work delegated to them as well as work that they'll, 
they, they'll have themselves. So, you know, is there an opportunity to delegate some of your, your management responsibilities to them already? So to start with, they could be in, you know, uh, less controversial areas or lower stakes areas so that people build that confidence, build that familiarity, and so that you build trust in their ability to, to successfully navigate those, those things. Um, yeah, and you know, if some of those responsibilities that you have that you're delegating uh, take up a lot of your time, then you know, that can be a good thing for you personally as well because it can free you up to use that time differently. So there's a benefit for you as well as for those individuals in terms of, uh, of their development. And yeah, there's also the engagement side of things as well to, to, to think about. So involving your kind of aspiring leaders in conversations about challenges and opportunities that the firm is facing or a particular department is facing can again just help build their capacity, their capability. Um, so, you know, you're involved in them. What is your view on this? How do you see it? What would you do in this situation? So it's all just helping to prepare them for the time, you know, when eventually they will be making the call on those things, when they eventually progress into those leadership roles themselves. And sometimes, you know, and this has been uh, revealed to, to me in conversations that I've been having with law firm leaders, you know, those conversations can actually reveal fresh insights or they can reveal fresh ideas to take forward. So actually, you know, it can be a source of inspiration as well uh, for, for the existing leaders as well as, a, as, a, as, a, as an engagement and development tool for those aspiring leaders. And Chris, finally, uh, I want to take a look then at the culture, if you like, within the firm as a way of continuing the development of the business. So the question is, how can clarifying the culture help us both now and in the future? So whilst culture has always been important for law firms, a number of recent events have helped push it up the agenda. So the first one is obviously the pandemic. That's all uh, that's required firms to think very carefully about how they work as well as what work they do. So that's had a real bearing and, 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 and forced firms to think quite carefully about their culture and what's important. Uh, a more recent trend is the uh, SRA's uh, work on workplace culture, which has resulted in a recent thematic review and the publication of some associated guidance. And yeah, interestingly, even though it is guidance, the SRA has said that they will have regard to that guidance and the expectations that it, that it sets of firms when, when the SRA comes to exercising its regulatory functions. So even though it's guidance, you know, there is that expectation that, that firms will um, at least have regard to it and, and, and take it on board. So that's, that's, that's pushed things up the agenda as well. Something else that we've noticed through the work that we've been doing is the uh, increasing importance of culture as a strategic enabler. So what do I mean by that? Well, using culture to support delivery of the firm's strategy. And the way in which we've been doing this in, pract in practical terms is through values and behaviors. So that may be refreshing the firm's existing values, or if those values remain valid, you know, keep, keep in, keeping them in place, but then translating them into behaviors. That's the really important step. And in particular, thinking about the behaviors that are gonna support delivery of the firm's strategy. So for example, you know, if the firm has decided that it wants to be more entrepreneurial, for example, to support delivery of its strategy, then you know, how do the values support that? What are the behaviors that the firm wants to see from its people, particularly its more senior people, on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that, you know, that entrepreneurial spirit is brought to life, if you like. Another one as well, you know, which, which uh, will resonate with, with, with some of you, I'm sure, is um, that, that how do you break down the silos? Okay, so what are the behaviors that you want to encourage to break down those silos? And we all know how much untapped potential there is within law firms if those silos can be broken down, e even in part. So, you know, if breaking down those silos is key, key to the firm's future strategy, what are the behaviors that are gonna support that? And then it's a case of taking those behaviors then and incorporating them into, you know, other, other structures, other systems and processes within the firm. So that could be appraisals, that's the obvious example. 
The alternative is to run a 360 feedback exercise to get a sense of the extent to which those behaviors are currently seen. Okay, so the way we do 360s, it's not a, it's not a performance tool. It's a, it's a case of identifying how often those behaviors are currently seen okay, by, by, uh, by others within the firm. And that then gives you that benchmark. Okay, these are the behaviors that are seen. These are our strengths. These are the things actually that, that we perhaps don't need to focus on. Or if we do need to focus, it's just a case of dialing them up. How can we lean on them a little bit more? And then these are the behaviors then that actually um, we, we, you know, we, we need to see more frequently. Okay, and that's not the same as saying people can't do them, it's just they're not being seen. Okay, and then the focus then in terms of development activity can be on you know, bringing them to the surface a little bit more, encouraging them and, and, and making it clear that um, you know, there's an expectation that leaders need to be displaying those behaviors more, more frequently. Um, so yeah, so using culture as a strategic enabler you know, has been a, a, a real trend for us. And yeah, just linking that as well to the, to the pandemic, you know, lots of the firms we've been working with as well have been using their values to help them navigate some of the complex decisions they faced over the last two years and using an individual value or the values as a, collectively as a lens on a particular challenge. Okay, so here's our challenge. We need to make a decision on this. Okay, if we were to uh, be bold, for example, that could be a value what would our decision be? Okay, so it's just using those values to help inform possibly the final decision, but also options. What are our options if we look at them through different lenses and, and use our values to support us? So that's been a really uh, useful uh, way of, 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 and practical way of using values over the last uh, couple of years in particular for, for some of our clients. And yeah, <laughs> capturing values and, and clarifying culture can also be really effective as well uh, for, uh, you know, in the context of succession planning as well. So let's say you're, you may be a small firm or you could be a, you know, a, a larger firm, but you're trying to create a lasting legacy. Okay, so that's what you're interested in. You're motivated by that. You know, when you retire, when you leave the firm, you want to make sure that, that, that there is that legacy there and that, you know, the firm continues to be a version of the firm it was while you, you were still there. So capturing those values, translating them into behaviors can help ensure that, that, that lasting legacy. So it can be used in that context as well. And of course, you know, just circling back to, to, the, to the talent uh, point and discussion from, uh, from, from, from earlier, so capturing your, your, your culture can, can, can help attract and retain that talent as well. So, you know, if you can give examples of how you bring your values to life, if you can give examples of how certain behaviors are encouraged or even rewarded, you know, they, that can be some, some, some specific and some concrete um, uh, examples that candidates can, can latch on to and that can give them a real clear sense of what the culture is going to be like in that firm. And again, for some people, maybe not everyone, but for some people, that might be enough to tip the balance and get them to choose your firm over a competitor's. Good. Excellent, Chris. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time and thanks for your very detailed and in-depth responses. OK, well, I hope that's all been, well, helpful, useful to all of you in identifying ways of uh, continuing to develop your businesses. That's all for me for now, but that's not all that's available, of course. You'll also see in the event box platform there are further sessions available to view. In particular, if you miss the sessions on diversity in the workplace, you're still able to catch up on these on demand. Simply go in to the diversity room and click the links of the sessions and you can find more uh, from me, of course, and a range of wonderful speakers giving you some great insights into how diversifying your workforce can benefit you. We're also inviting people from the black, Asian and minority ethnic community to share their experience of Business Wales support by taking part in our research, our focus group research. We equally would like to speak to community members and stakeholders about their thoughts, their responses to Business Wales marketing campaigns. If you'd like to be included in this research, please email us at focus.group at businesswales.org.uk. Once again, focus.group 
at businesswales.org.uk. And finally, please remember you can continue to draw on help and support, of course, from Business Wales. To get in touch, well, you'll see on the screen ways to find your local advisors who will only be too willing to help you to continue to deliver on your business development goals. Please also keep your eyes open for some specific workshops from Business Wales around legal practice starter. So, Eto, thank you so much for your time today. And for now, Hulvav, goodbye.